All right, troops, strong and conditioned, live and direct from Glasgow, Scotland. And today I have the great honour of having one of the most interesting men in the fitness world today. And interesting in many ways, because this man is a professional bodybuilder, a professional strongman, and this is the one that I really love. He's a professional wrestler. And anybody that listens to me knows I am a huge fan, a massive mark <laughs> for wrestling. So if this podcast diverts into wrestling, I make no apologies. We have the creator of one of the most brutal training programs known to man, Deep Water, Mr. John Anderson. John, how are you, brother? I'm great, brother. Thank you for the nice introduction. I'm happy to be here. <clears throat> I didn't know you were a big wrestling fan. You know, that's, that's really cool. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge wrestling fan, an absolutely huge wrestling fan. And that's something I would like to touch upon just for my own gratification. However, well, you know, well, Yeah, you know, real quick, before we get off the wrestling, I know we're going to go other places first. You know, when I worked with New Japan, which was kind of, that was the, my, the, the big company I worked for. <clears throat> Actually, one of my best friends from that company, I worked there for six years, is now in WWE. He's from your neck of the woods. He's from uh, he's I is Irish. Uh, right. Is uh, Finn Balor. He's like the top of the top right now. And yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. So we we were we rode a lot of tour buses together over in Japan. Really yeah. cool cat. What was his name in New Japan? It was Prince something. Well, his real name is Fergal Devitt. So he just went off of Prince Devitt. Right, Prince David, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I like Finn. I, I like Finn Balor, and I, I know his uh, finisher is the coup de grace. And the reason I know this is because I've been watching a lot of wrestling lately, and I've been getting right into the Judgment Day storyline. Anyway, John, <laughs> <laughs> John, a lot of my listeners are the big boppy fans, bodyweight training fans, so they may yeah. not be aware of your presence. So, can you give me a brief introduction? Yeah, well, I guess I guess the question is, do you want me to kind of give you the timeline which connects it all together? And you know, right, okay. um, you know, Let, let's go for the timeline. The timeline's always good. Yeah, because so, a, lot, a lot of times people they look at me, they you know, like you introduced me to three different three different sports that I did, and a lot of times if people often the question I get is, you know, why, how, you know, just how did this all happen? Well, it all goes back to the very beginning. You know, I was actually, uh, I can't just be blunt. I was, I was fucking fat. I was lazy. I was, you know, at a whopping learning disability. <clears throat> and I had created a pretty massive addiction to food, which was really was comfort. When I say addiction, it was the way I comforted myself. And so I just, you know, it was like, I love sports. I came from a sports family, but I was just, I had to work extra hard just to be average. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I always felt that like, God, you know, I just inside, I was burning to do something great, but I was constantly looking for that greatness in the bottom of an ice cream container. So I wasn't making much headway. <laughs> and so <clears throat> what I'm getting at is that I knew the first time that I saw a big, strong dude, it was actually I'm funny. I saw uh, Arnold in Conan, but then at that point, other big guys and I was just so, and I'm probably what, six or seven years old. So right in the peak of looking for greatness in the bottom of an ice cream container, you know? <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I just, it, I knew at that point, I was like, I didn't want anything else. So, you know, like, you know, you, what do you want to do? For, what do you want to do when you grow up? You know, I want to be a truck driver. That's what I used to say before that. Next thing you know, I want to be a big, strong guy. So I had this burn in my belly to be a big, strong guy. And at that point, it was like, it's almost like, I don't know, it, it kind of all of a sudden made sense to me. You know, I mean, granted, I still had a hard time being a lazy piece of crap, but at least I kind of knew what I wanted to do. And <clears throat> so <clears throat> I started playing sports and lifting weights, and I quickly realized I was better at lifting weights than the sports I was playing. And at this point, I've actually made some progress. and I'm, I've, I've actually started to not be a, a, a fat little guy. I've actually started to be strong and put on some muscle. And I had this burn in my belly. It was like, I remember, you know, you do those dumb little things in your head. Like, you know, if someone someone cut off your pinky, would you give your pinky away to be a pro bodybuilder? 
not a problem. I mean, I would I would be fingerless right now. I would have lost three fingers to have my career because at that time I didn't believe that I could do any of what I did. But point is, is that because I had this burn in my belly to, you know, that was all kind of weightlifting based, you know, it was first I wanted to be a bodybuilder. That was my first big run. But then uh, there was this thing in the mid nineties where uh, bodybuilding took a bad rap because there was some sort of a thing where a bunch of the, the bot, the, the amateur bodybuilders had gotten exposed for doing sexual favors for money so they could get the drugs they needed to compete. And it was like, you know, I'm like a te- like a late teen. And that just blew the top off of for me. I was just like, Whoa, where's all this coming from? This doesn't sound like what I, so I kind of, at that point started leaning into strength. <clears throat> and so, but it's still the same for me. I'm just a big, strong guy. Okay. Do I want to lift something heavier? Do I want to, do I want to, you know, flex on stage? So anyway, long and short of it is that that burn in my belly and being that fat little boy having to work twice as hard as everybody else just to get on the field is really what my biggest blessing was because I developed this work ethic that allowed me to make progress so much faster than the people around me. And that's what I deem deep water. Deep water, everybody refers to it as a, a workout, but it's really a mindset. It's a mindset of committing to what you're doing all the way. Don't think about the next one you're going to do. Don't think about tomorrow. Are you in it present, full blown right now, here all the way? And I committed to, I pretty much committed everything I do that way. And it's really, it changed my life early on. But long and short of it is that because I developed this really nasty work ethic in this methodology of really, really committing to something, which I call deep water now. It's allowed me to just navigate, you know, first I was a pro strongman and had a back surgery. I'm like, God, that burn, just like I was 10 years old all over, that burn is still there. So boom, I, I went to wrestling, you know, <clears throat> got released in wrestling. I come home from Japan, that burn's still there. Well, fuck, I guess I'm going to go do bodybuilding. And so really my timeline is my biggest blessing is I was a fat little piece of shit that had to learn to work twice as hard as everybody else just to be even just to be par. So that allowed me to kind of, to understand what hard work was. And then when I kind of took it to the next level by really, you know, recognizing it wasn't just working hard. It was about truly committing to what you're doing and be present in everything you do, which quote deep water. And now, you know, God, 25 years later, I've I've got three fairly deep, fairly nice athletic accomplishments attached to my name. So. Excellent, excellent. So a lot to unpack there, John. Let, let, let's go right back to the beginning when okay. you speak about developing these food issues as a, a teenager, for example. Yeah. W- what were these food issues in particular? Well, as I said, I was kind of a, a, a lazy, fat little piece of shit. And keep in mind, I'm not playing the victim. I did all this to myself. I had a loving family. I wasn't abused. I wasn't molested. There was no reason that I did what I did other than the fact that I have an insatiable love for cookies and ice cream. (laughs) And so (laughs) basically really what it came down to was as I was, you know, I was a late bloomer. That's what set it all off. So I went from, you know, being kind of, you know, the average kid to all of a sudden everybody grew and I didn't, you know, to the point where, you know, I was like the only kid in freshman football climbing in the showers without a single fucking hair in his dick. Like I was two <laughs> years behind. Yeah, I'm two years behind. And so, you know, when you're two years behind, that's a lot of that's a lot of fucking runway to get picked to get picked to get picked on it shit. You know, so yeah. what I as I started as I started to kind of go from average to behind average, I started using food to cope. I mean, I was always a chunky little sucker, but once. Once food became my friend to, to deal with, you know, forgetting about what happened at, uh, you know, on the bus or at school that day or whatever, that's when everything really started to unfold. And then it, it literally just became, it became, a, it was, it was just a straight up crutch. You know, at, at a certain point, it wasn't even like, I can remember, it took me till I was 25 to kick this shit. This was not something I'm still, I still have it. I, once an addict, always an addict. You know, yeah. I I, yeah. I can't eat a cookie right now. I eat a fucking cookie. I'll eat. I'll be having my car keys in my hand. I'm driving to the nearest convenience store to buy a bunch of shit. You know, it's like you can't you can't tell a heroin addict to have just a little bit of his fix. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> you you can't put a fucking alcoholic in a bar and expect yeah. he's going to be okay. So 
anyway, really what it came, it came to be, it was just a straight up escape. And then as the addiction gets worse, anytime something doesn't go right, it's like it just becomes easier and easier to run to your safe haven, run to your distraction. And so the addiction just got worse and worse and worse. And thank God I was able to take that addiction and just keep in mind, I'm kicking ass at the gym. I'm, fuck, I'm by 25. I'm squatting 600 pounds for 10 reps. You know, I mean, I'm I'm pretty much the strongest guy anywhere I walk into an, into a regular commercial gym. But I still eat a fucking cookie and I'll disappear for two days eating fucking junk like a druggie. You know, so these two things were running side by side. You know, I mean, I was making tons of progress with with my training and everything, but food was kicking my ass. You know, it really was, man. Yeah, yeah. And, and so when it came down to it, part of what I teach in my, my coaching is I, f- I had to fix myself first, you know, and when I realized, holy shit, these are all the things that I learned to fix myself, I can really spot it in others. You know, like yeah. we all have triggers. There's certain things in our day, our lives that, that will happen and, and we run for our crutch, whatever the crutch is. Maybe it's a drink, maybe it's a smoke, maybe it's a drug, maybe it's food. And so <clears throat> anyway, going back to your question about food and that whole thing is it was it just kind of it just kind of turned into a spiral and it got worse and worse. And the thing is when you're in the middle of it, you don't really realize how bad it is until finally, you know, somebody or something comes along that makes it real evident. Like like one of the situations that helped me realize how, how bad it had gotten was. So I'm, again, I'm in my early twenties, you know, so I'm, I'm not fat anymore. I'm a big, strong dude. I still see myself as a fat guy, but yeah. anyway, <clears throat> anyway, I'm on the couch and I've overeaten for probably the last 12 to 15 hours. And I've in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to stop at a certain time. So I got to keep forcing it in. That's, you know, it's, <laughs> and so I'm laying on the couch. I got a pair of underwear on only because I'm sweating because I've eaten so much. I'm just fucking sweating all over. And I'm laying on on the couch. And I've got this Tupperware. I'm laying my back Tupperware of M&Ms. And I'm feeding them to myself one by one because I can fucking barely breathe because I've eaten so much. <laughs> and a buddy of mine walks into my apartment. And he comes in and he sees me there. And keep in mind, I had thought the front door was locked. I was hiding. He comes in. And he looks at me and he goes, what the fuck are you doing? It was like, it didn't make sense to him. It was like, he'd never seen that part of me before. You know, yeah, the part yeah. of me that just had no fucking, just didn't get it. And he, it just kind of came out of his mouth. He goes, dude, have some self-respect. And it was like, bam, it was like a fucking bomb went off of my head. I was like, whoa. I'm yeah. getting I'm getting a different this is not me hiding anymore lying to myself I've been exposed and now someone that's dear to me has called me out on this and you start you you start to be a little bit more real with yourself and right. that's, okay. the fir- that's the first step right so just to interject okay I, I mean I'm just like creating an image in my head and it's you lying on your couch eating m and <laughs> Why was that so shocking to your friend? Because I'll be honest, to me, it doesn't sound crazy because we all like M&Ms. So what okay. was it about that that was so shocking to your friend? Well, okay, so remember, I'm laying on the couch. I'm in my fucking underwear because I'm sweating profusely because I've eaten so much and I can barely breathe. You got to remember that part about And then I'm eating one at a time. So he sits there watching me for a minute before he says something, I'm sure. And he sees me breathing shallow because I can't take a fucking deep breath because my, I mean, I look like I'm probably half pregnant because my stomach is so protruded because I've been stuffing myself, you know, it was, and it was, it was, it wasn't the act of eating M&Ms that he was calling out. It was the act of what did you do to yourself? And you're still continuing to do it. Yeah, yeah. Do you think it was because, like, you obviously were putting up big numbers in the gym and you're a big guy? Do you think he was equating what you're capable of and seeing you do something that flew in the face? I think he, I think he was at that age. You know, most people think if you're going to do something like that to yourself, it's with alcohol, yeah. not with food, not with food. That makes sense. Oh, yeah, I'm going to drink until I puke. I'm going to get real pissed. I'm going to do that. That makes sense to people. 
Eating yeah. until you can't breathe, eating until you're miserable, that doesn't make yeah. sense to many people. Yeah, yeah. But the thing is, is like when you drink, you, you tend to have fun. When you take drugs, you, you, you think you're having fun. Yeah, yeah. When you're eating, you're not having fun, really. You're just eating. It's, you're it's, just doing a natural process. It was self-loathing, straight up yeah. self-loathing. The thing about food is, though, is that people do underestimate the potency of the addictive qualities of food oh. because it's readily available. It's yep. everywhere, and we need that. We don't need alcohol. We don't no. need drugs, but we need food. So you're trying yep. to temper a, a, an addiction to a certain type of food, which is yep. readily available. Yeah, so and that's right there, brother. Right there is where I finally figured out. I was like, okay, it's not food. It's sugar. And as soon yeah. as I registered it with sugar, because I wasn't reg I didn't realize that every time I ate a little bit of sugar, that's what was throwing me off the edge. In my mind, I was something went wrong. I was running for comfort and sugar was the first thing. I didn't realize that if I ran for comfort and ate a bunch of chicken breast, that it wouldn't turn into a two day ordeal. So that's what I started to do. Right. I basically that was the beginning of deep water philosophy of food was okay sugar's out well i realized that rice would pretty much do the same thing to me so eventually it just i eliminated the carbohydrate altogether because i knew if i ran for food and i tried to comfort myself and there was no sugar involved i wasn't gonna i might get a stomach ache but it wasn't gonna turn into two days right okay right so the, the deep water nutrition is something that i want to touch upon but let's go back to that time yeah. again and let's talk about the training that you initially began in your journey and how you began that training what was it you were doing john well so in terms of the my training so i had such a burn in my belly to to get where i wanted to go and be a big strong guy i had no idea i was going to turn it into a lifestyle but you know thank god i figured that part out um <laughs> But I was I was burning through training partners. Like I mean, I would have a training partner for a couple of weeks, and they'd be gone. Yeah. And so finally, I just said, "Fuck this shit." Every time I loved to train with people at that time too. It was really fun. But I also got really disappointed when they would quit. So, yeah. and usually when they would quit, it's because I was thinking of some fucking crazy thing to do that was really painful. Because I yeah. I equated pain to progress. Yeah. And, uh, okay. Were you taking the pain of your sugar addiction and projecting it in the gym? You know, that's a good question, brother. I think I think when it came down to it, when I was in the gym, it was almost like two separate jobs. You know, you know, when I was in the gym, I was I mean, I used to be there in my teens, like in college. Sometimes I'd be in the gym for four hours because I just liked to be there. I liked who I was when I was there, you know, and it was like it was just, a, it felt very safe to me. It was, I was happy. I was making progress. I was somehow felt like I was getting closer to what I really wanted in my life. But I think that, I think the pain and the anguish that I put myself through in training, I just felt like the, the harder I came from a, an athletic background and, and the harder we worked, usually the more we want, you know, in terms of team sports. So I just, it just made sense to me. You know, we were some, real competitive teams and they used to run the shit out of us. And when we were, when we were on those teams, we always did really well. So, but anyway, to answer your question, the training that I was doing in those early days, which is really what, uh, what now is, you know, the roots of the real brutal deep water training is like, I would put say four or five on a, on a squat bar. And most people say, Oh, I'm going to do this for five. I'm going to do this for 10 or whatever it is. I would look at that and say, how many can I do it for? And I would basically pick a weight and just see how many I could do because that, that part where you're, you really, really making progress. I, I realized that when you don't think you can do another one, but you, you find out that you can, that's where the real pro that, you know, that the first, let's say the first 10 reps are difficult. And then you get to 10 and you think, God, I don't know if I can do it again. And you get to 11. And they think, okay, try again. You get to 12. Maybe you end up getting to 14. Those last four reps are worth more than the first 10. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and once I started to realize that, I was like, okay, I got to pay the piper just to get into that area where I start making some serious gains. So that's why I started realizing these really grueling long sets. I was only going to get a couple of them. But once I got past that point where 
like in my book, I actually tall, I actually call it going into a portal. It's like, you just, you, you just see this opportunity, you dive into this little space and it's like, you know, things start to hurt less. And, and it's like, you're in the, you only, you don't get them that often because you can't get into that space. And really what it is, you've gotten to a certain point where your body has dumped, your brain has dumped so many endorphins and, you know, all these different positive chemicals helping you deal with the shock of what you're putting yourself through. Pain starts to go away. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But, but that's the beginning of, uh, <clears throat> that's the beginning of, of the deep water training. And like one of the other concepts that I developed, which was, you know, like failure, everybody talks about failure. Okay. You go to failure, go to failure, go to failure. Well, most people have never really experienced failure. Here's how I taught myself to do that. I would take that like in, in my strength career when we would do squat events, it was always 700 pounds during that era. So I would walk 700 pounds out of a squat rack on the outside, not on the inside of the cage. I would change the hook. So it's on the outside. I'd walk it out and I would not have a spotter on purpose because I had no intention of walking it back in. I was going to go until I crashed. And that's how I try. That's how I taught myself. You've already accepted you're going to fail before you start to set. It's yeah. a very different mindset. When you think, okay, I'm not putting this away. Well, fuck, I might as well get as many as I can since I'm going to be out here fucking, you know, going through all this. Yeah, and then, of yeah. course, when you go down, you you got to be pretty careful to get out of there so you don't get trapped under the bar. But that's part of yeah. the that's part of the experience. <laughs> yeah. So, so what that sounds to me is is you're you're taking a hostile environment and amplifying it by walking outside the cage which is kind of reflective of the deep water program and your mindset in that respect. So w when you first began training, like before the, the, the evolution of deep water or the, yep. the creation of deep water, were you initially following like a bodybuilding split or a cookie cutter training program? And then you started to add elements on using the, the your <coughs> mindset, so to speak. That's a great question, brother, because, you know, I'm <clears throat> I'm 51. And so if we go back to when I was uh, <clears throat> late in my teens, there was very little information. Yeah. And it, yeah. Was, and it was like, I mean, you, it was almost like you, even in, when you did find someone that was a big guy in the gym in those days, he wouldn't answer a question for you. It's like you had to, you had to earn your stripes. You know, if, if this guy didn't see you in there busting, busting your ass for a long time, he wouldn't even, you know, you might ask him a question. He just might kind of giggle and keep walking, you know, yeah, yeah, like yeah, I'm not yeah. going to waste my time with you kid. So yeah. really I learned from, I didn't really know what the fuck it was. <clears throat> I was like, well, shit, that big guy's doing, he's doing, you know, bench press and he's doing five reps. I guess I would better do that. You know, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. It, it was literally. And then, um, then unfortunately at that time, I way overtrained myself because I thought more was better. So I was training every muscle three times a week, mm -hmm. but you know, destroying myself. It, yeah, that it, it dealt, it helped me develop my mental edge, but I, I could have made a lot more progress faster had I given my body more time to heal. <clears throat> okay. Wait, so you said something interesting there because like I, I, I train full body three times a week. So technically I had a, exercise or a, a muscle group three times a week yep however that's just one like three sets of chest which is divvied up over nine yep. sets throughout the week yep. nine hard sets yep but i'm i think it might be safe to assume that you weren't following a similar approach i assume you were following yep. like a, a extremely high volume chest day three times a week yeah 100 percent. see what with you, brother, you you're coming from we're kind of coming from the opposite sides of the equation. You you're yeah. you know, you're doing stuff like you're talking about doing three times a week, but but what you do in those three workouts would still be less than what I was than, than what I would do in one workout for once a week. So it's it's just a different approach. You know, yeah. you want you give the body a little stimulation, let it recover. A little stimulation, let it recover. It's all about that that balance. Well, you give it a big whack and let it recover or, or you give it a little one. It's, it's kind of how you choose to do it, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But when, you, when you're when you approaching it with that addictive mindset, then that ceases to exist because 
recovery doesn't come into the the, the 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 system so to speak because you just want to train all the time because you were scratching an itch so to speak and that's yeah, something I mean, that, i'm assuming you learned down the road yeah i mean there's no question that that i you know i used my I mean, my training was was my love and it was my therapy. It was like what allowed me to it just without it. I, I don't even know where I would be right now, <clears throat> you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. and you're totally correct. It was it was more than it served a lot of purposes. And so that was one of the things that I really, really lacked the understanding of in the early days was the, the balance that was necessary for recovery. Like when I coach people right now. Um, you know, cause I coach, I mean, what I coach now is I love to coach just regular people that want to have a better quality of life because I, and, and to keep in mind, I've taken my philosophy and I've really kind of make it work for them. But what I'm getting at is in there, they are people, even the regular people of the world, you know, they're like, Oh God, I, I, I can't miss the gym. I'm like, listen, I know you could train three times a week in this five day split I've given you, as long as your nutrition's on point, we're going to be fine. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and and that's the element that I didn't get way back when was that that balance of of rest, recovery, nutrition. You're you're better off to do less in your training than more. Yeah, yeah. And, and how, how do you temper this like this almost crush, kill, destroy mindset when you're coaching clients? Well, <clears throat> because here's the thing: it's it's kind of like well, first off, I, I guess the probably a lot of different things. I've, I have girls. I have no boys. I always make the joke. I think if I had boys, the state would have taken them from me because I'd have been too hard on them. <laughs> yeah, well, well I've, I've got a daughter myself and, and yeah. I know daughters are a completely different. Kettle of fish. Yeah. So, so, I mean, it's, but see the, the deep water philosophy is it's, it's kill for me, but what get again, deep water applies itself to whomever. So, if, if someone's goal is to gain 10 pounds of muscle, drop 10 pounds of body fat, and have more energy and a better quality of life, then that the philosophy attaches itself to that. And yeah. when, when we'd say like, <clears throat> you know, kill, kill like this aggressive, it's, it's, a, it's a mindset. It's a position on getting your job done. It doesn't, yeah. mean, doesn't mean, you know, beat yourself to a pulp. If beating yourself to a pulp is part of the program, then that's what it calls for. Yeah, but yeah. realistically, it's it's actually it's much easier for me to coach people who just want to have some, you know. When I say normal people, I'm not downplaying that. <clears throat> I mean, not competitors. Um, I mean, it's it's great when I find someone that has a food addiction like myself. Sometimes they're slightly overweight. Sometimes they're way overweight. But man, I can ch I can change those people's lives so easily because I'm one of them. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you think that as you have got older, you have become more tolerant of people who don't have the same mindset as you? You know, <clears throat> that's a good question. Um, I think what it comes down to is I get older. I mean, in my business, what I do is is I don't, I don't, I only work with the people that I feel I'm going to be successful with. And really what that means is I just need them to be open-minded. So it's not so much the mindset that I have, but I need open-mindedness. That makes sense? Because if someone's yeah. open-minded and they give me a clean slate, I can program their minds with seeing things from a different side, which will then really help them get what they want. Does that yeah, make sense? Yeah. It makes but I, sense. But what you're saying is really good, brother, because, you know, the it's – I choose to use my methodology to be me because this is who I always want to be as a fat little boy. But, you know, my methodology can apply itself to anybody that wants to be what they want to be. It's just obviously I am the billboard because it's me. Um, <laughs> but on that level, to answer your question, I will say that I'm, <clears throat> I'm actually very good at avoiding people that I coach or in my life. Uh, and it's just, I just don't like the people that, that are filled with, I can'ts. And, you know, it's like, I don't like the, I don't like the limitation and the mindset, meaning that they're not open to expand it. 
Okay, okay. But, uh, do you know, it's, it's interesting that you highlight that people need to be open-minded because this leads into my next question. And it's, it's something that makes deep water stand out from conventional programs. And it's there's a few things here. Number one is that deep water is a story. And mm. I spoke about this with uh, my last guest, Jared Miller, who I feel really... Uh, popularized deep water within certain elements of the online community. He took the, the the deep water program and really ran with it and and got its name out there. Uh, so with deep water, there's there's a story attached to it, and you don't get stories attached to programs because most programs are just bench press, squat, four or five sets, numbers, letters. Whereas your program had a story, and a story is something that people react to because mm -hmm. we told stories from the dawn of time. Yeah. So that's one of the things that makes deep water stand out. The second one is that deep water is not a conventional workout. It's something that I would personally call a challenge style workout. There's no defined end result in the sense where you're going to put on this or you're going to lose this. The result is completing the program because it's a fucking monster journey. <laughs> <laughs> and number three is the nutritional element, which is absolutely unique because it's something that you have used to turn things round on its head. And it's obviously something that had a profound effect on your ability to perform. So, why did you write Deep Water as a story, as opposed to just a program that like people put in? <clears throat> that's a great question, brother. So, that's the story in itself. So, <laughs> so here's the story of the, of the Deep Water story. <laughs> so... <clears throat> Okay, so as I'm moving through, you know, my journey, right, strong, uh, pro, pro Strongman was my first one. And as I became more internationally recognized and I started traveling the world more, I started to realize that I was dealing with, you know, guys that were, I mean, fuck, man, they were fucking good. And <clears throat> the first thing you got to start to realize, okay, what do I need to improve? Because I, I don't need to, I need to make sure that I'm able to, to do what I got to do out there. So what I would do is I would have a training partner that represented, like I had a, a training partner that helped me in the power list. I had a training partner that helped me in the Olympic list. I had a training partner that helped me with the strongman lift. So I had all these different partners because they were, they were specifically good in those, in that, in their, their genre. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And so my Olympic lifting coach, <clears throat> a great guy named Yasha Faye. Um, <clears throat> anyway, he he was the guy that helped me with an Olympic yeah. lifting as well. That's difficult shit to get down, you know, yeah, not know. easy, yeah. <clears throat> but he was actually, uh, he was, God, he was a junior champion. So he lived at the, the training center at, of Colorado Springs when he was a, like a 19, 20 year old. So he was under some of the best coaches that America had to offer. And the, the standard Olympic lifting is just, you know, two, three reps. You know, you rarely get out of a triple in yeah. standard Olympic lifting programming. And so I'm asking him to teach me how to do this stuff. <clears throat> and he's quickly realizing that I don't want to do low reps, that I'm, I need to do high reps. Because strongman was, okay, how, how many times can you lift this axle up to your shoulders and over your head in 90 seconds? There's a lot more than three going on there. So I started doing these. I started, you know, working out with him. And he sees me doing these, these you know, longer sets. And he just wants me to do three. And I'm like, no, I, this is not I, – I need to – get conditioned i said i don't need you to coach me when i'm fresh i need you to coach me when i'm sucking ass that's what yeah, i need yeah. to help yeah i said i i'm i'm good and you know first 30 seconds i'm good but when i get tired that's when i need the technique yeah, you know i mean yeah, I, yeah. I need the technique the whole time but i need your help when i when i when i'm start to suck wind yeah. and so that's where so this is where the whole thing came from so he we put a weight on it. He said, "Okay, we're here. We go." And I start going to work. <clears throat> and you know, we we trained clean and press over, overhead quite often. That was one of the big ones we did. And uh, so he would say, 
okay, he'd see me start sucking wind. And he'd, he'd, he'd stand up out of his chair and he'd say, hey, you're in deep water now. Here we go. Let's get tough. Let's get focused. Because he told me, this is what I need. When you start doing this, I need you to remember this. And blah, he'd start yelling at me what to do. So when he recognized that I was starting to struggle, he'd say, okay, you're in deep water now. Let's go. So deep water meaning that, you know, you, you, you're swimming offshore as hard as you can and you have no regards for how you're going to get home. And that was when we really started to work. And so that's how the name deep water came up. And then from there, uh, Mark Bell had actually asked, uh, asked if he could do a couple of stories on my training. So, uh, we did some, we did some articles on deep water in his magazine and then he's like, dude, he's like, I think we did two or three of them in his magazine. He's like, dude, there's a book here. You got to do a book about this. And so that's where the whole thing came about. And so in the book, you know, there's training tales, there's different mindset philosophies. And, but the, the actual training, I do a beginners, I do an intermediate and advanced program in that book. But yeah, keep in mind, yeah. yeah, and keep in mind, that was God. Oh, man over 10 years ago. So it's developed a lot since then. Yeah, but, yeah. but realistically, what it comes down to is if, if you look at a lot of the training in that stuff, especially when you get into the media, uh, intermediate and advanced, it's really, a, it's more philosophy based. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. yeah. The thing that, that interests me about uh, deep water, and this was something I spoke about with my last guest as well, is that the preg the progressive overload element of deep water is in the recovery periods. That's the, 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 the variable that stands out. It's not like you must be progressing weight every session. It's no, we are going to stick with the same weight, but we are going to, like take that weight and we are going to make sure we get that volume in in a shorter time frame as time goes on and th that adds a whole different level of brutality because yeah. when you put the weights up you can reset the reps and you can start having this yeah. go so yeah. you're having just this sort of like this ebb and flow whereas you're like fuck this shit we are just going to crank it up to 11 <laughs> <laughs> like, because you know it's it's kind of like when like if you're really giving it up if you're truly getting in deep deep water you know and i'm talking advanced stuff here you know this is not 10 sets of 10 stuff 10 sets of 10 stuff is what builds you to what i'm talking about yeah where it you if you truly give it up right you're gonna need a certain amount of rest you couldn't possibly go back in a certain time period and and as you get a little bit more, I guess that the whole idea is, you know, when you push the limits that far, like, here, let me make an example. <clears throat> like one of the things that I never quite accomplished, I wish that I could say I did is, is four plates on a squat. Could, how few sets can you get it for a hundred reps? Right. Well, I, I was able to get it with four sets all the time, but I never quite got it with three. And <clears throat> The rest periods between those three sets when I was trying were sometimes phenomenally long, but it, it's like there's a certain point where it almost doesn't make a difference. You get to a certain point, it's, it's, it's your muscles are recovered. It's just like you're almost having to get your spirit back ready to go back into that zone again, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the, the thing that always captures my attention, particularly nowadays, is – that deep water is the opposite of the information that is being pumped out nowadays where it's all about being optimal and hitting the muscle from a certain angle. And the thing is, is if you don't adhere to that thinking, people tend to discard the information when they realize that there's other things that can be taken from these programs. So to, to expand on that, when you talk about failure, the big thing nowadays is failure. There's been a resurgence of Mike Mentzer, heavy duty training, <clears throat> and everybody talks about failure, whereas you were creating the environment for failure by walking outside the power rack, making the, the environment more dangerous and also pushing the reps up so high and keeping the recovery time so short that it, you were going to fail no matter what at some point. So you're creating an environment for failure. And that's to me, is like something that just 
happens naturally instead of you like thinking like having that as a like something set in stone it's like failure's just something that that, that, that happens naturally if you want results yeah. it's not something we should be talking about it's something that's obvious yeah 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 i agree with that 100 percent, brother yeah yeah so and and on that but on that level i think what you're saying is is so true but i think when, when it comes down to it it's like especially in today you know it's like if there's something new that is easier but the fact that it's new everybody runs to it and there, you know what i mean <clears throat> there's certain things like you talk about failure you know failures this this it, it, like you said it's just kind of like okay yes this is it's it kind of why talk about it it's like okay yes we know we need this but nobody really understands it because people say they do but they don't Does that makes sense it's like okay well, here's a, I'm, I'm not making a lot of sense here we're both fathers right well we understand what it's like to be a father but someone who's not a father doesn't understand that does that make sense and <laughs> we could never say. and we couldn't possibly have a conversation to help them understand it until all of a sudden they watch their baby be born that yeah. is it's, it's like okay you can't put that in words well failure is kind of like a i'm not trying to compare failure to childbirth but or, or <laughs> but 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 fails the same way <clears throat> is that people think they know but they don't and and that's the problem <laughs> is is that now that there's this huge breed of people that have trained in programs trained to fail trained to failure and that means oh yeah i don't think i can get another one no that's not failure you know failure yeah. is, is is it's a little more shrewd than that and so i guess on that level it is kind of weird because failure is this term that so few people truly understand, but just about everybody will tell you they know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. Because failure is ultimately a skill. Yes. You need to, you need yes. to learn what failure is. Yes. You and you know, brother, I, 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 God damn it, what you just said makes such – I just put a post out today talking about failure and saying, look, fail, and it's not just in training. Failure is a skill in your life. You have to realize that whatever it is you're working for, whatever you deem success, failure is a part of that equation. And it's a very important part of that equation. Yeah. You're going to fail. You're going to learn. You're going to innovate. You're going to change something. You're going to repeat. And every time you do that, you get a little closer to your goal. But yeah. people are so goddamn afraid of failure because they think failure is bad. They think they fail like that's, oh, no, no. Failure is good thing. Quitting is a bad thing yeah 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 and yeah. people don't see the difference no you failed but you got up and you kept going if yeah. you fail and you stayed on the ground like a little bitch okay now you quit now <laughs> failure is a very bad thing because failure whipped your ass if you don't allow failure to to, to make you to quit failure is beautiful it's so fucking powerful but most people don't realize that the power behind it yeah, jo John, I'm having so much fun here, and I'm like, I'm, I'm going to start ping ponging between subjects because you're saying a lot of things <laughs> that keep grabbing my attention. But one that you did say five minutes ago, and it really, it, it's something that will appeal to guys who watch me, who follow me for burpees and bodyweight training. And it was when you were speaking about the guy who was coaching you with the power cleans and high reps, and you were talking about yep. you wanted to, you wanted to basically what you're saying is, is you understand that you need to be like kicking ass in a highly deconditioned state. Yes. And because, because like recovery is an industry nowadays. Everybody talks about recovery. It's like you do this, you do that. You need to fucking recover. It's just constant recovery. And to me, that just says that everybody goes into the gym fresh, but you're never fresh in life. You're always in a tired state and you should be yeah. ready when you're yeah. deconditioned, you should be ready to be at the top of your game when you're fucking tired. Instead yeah. of walking into the gym all fresh as a daisy, foam rolled out of your tits, you're just kind of ready to rock. Whereas you want to be in that zone where you are fucking on the floor, but you can still perform. That's what you really <clears throat> want to train. And that was something that really grabbed my attention when you said that, because that reminds me of doing high rep body weight training, burpees and so forth. So. You know, brother, I'll tell you, I've done a lot of high weight in my, like when I was in my wrestling career, there were times when we would be, 
in Japan, they call it the countryside. It just means that it's not a city. It's a town. That's what they call yeah. the countryside. And the gyms there were, I was almost better off not to go because they had such little equipment. I would just literally do workouts in my hotel room. Yeah. And so, I mean, I can't tell you how many, I mean, doing sets of 100 bodyweight squats, You, if you can do 10 of those, you're a fucking badass, you know? <laughs> you know, and, and if you know, tell you people, oh, you got to lift heavy weights. I went through I went through a seven year period where I probably only got to go to the gym about half of my workouts. Yeah. But I was doing push ups, <clears throat> I was doing sit ups, I was doing body weight squats, I was doing squat explodes. So the the high rep body weight stuff, I believe, is so overlooked when it comes to not only conditioning, it's you can't argue. But you're also going to actually develop some pretty serious strength. And, and if you do, you know, if you're eating accordingly, you can develop some size with it too. Yeah, you know? yeah. That was my experience. I, I was that guy who looked at a uh, high rep body weight stuff th through the lens of bodybuilding and was under the impression that it would not make a dent until I started doing it. And I thought, this is actually really a fucking profound training experience. Mm -hmm. So... Right, let's go into the nutrition side because I, I want to talk about this. This is something that really interests me and I, and I think it will interest a lot of people. It's it's the nutritional strategy that, that comes with deep water. It's, as I already explained, it's taking that sugar addiction and turning it on its head. How did you develop this, John? Well, real quick for anyone that's, you know, that knows any bit about what we're talking about. You're, we're talking about some of the beginning of it. Now, the latest deep water in the last five years <clears throat> has gone leaps and bounds. And the foundation of the whole thing is digestion. Because digestion is something that people don't understand enough. Um, <clears throat> so just to kind of when we're just to kind of let the viewers know that we're going back and talking about the beginning, but there's been a massive evolution to all. And so the the latest evolution is is ends up all in a person's digestion. So that being said, forgive me, brother. Can you please repeat the question? I understood you perfectly. I didn't know. <laughs> I just fucking forgot. I'll be honest. <laughs> uh, the question was, how did you develop the nutritional strategy that comes uh, with deep water? Yeah. So <clears throat> by realizing that I was cutting out sugar, right? At first it was sugar. Then it was carbohydrate because carbohydrate kept leading me to sugar. You know, it's really carbohydrate <clears throat> can break down, um, you know, it can break down into, a, you know, like for me, even rice, rice would put me into, it would, it would crack my, whatever it is that goes, that, that flips in my head, rice would do it just like a candy bar. So as I removed carbohydrate to try to control my, you know, my addiction, my food addiction, I also started to realize, okay, you're eating a lot of protein, a lot of vegetables and protein, and, and you're to be satiated, you're going to have to eat the meat or the protein, because the vegetables aren't going to satiate you. So the amount of meat I was eating shot through the roof. Well, you know, what followed that meat going through the roof was my fucking strength. So I was like, okay, you know, we, this is like stumbling across something really interesting here. You know, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I know there's been a few major inventions that have just, they were a, a mistake but, you know, they found this this amazing step forward, you know, accidentally. Well, that's kind of what happened with me is I eliminated um, carbohydrate out of a necessity to control my addiction. Then I started eating more, you know, flesh, let's call it. This is back when protein shakes were like, you know, fucking drinking, a, you know, it'd be like putting cardboard in a fucking blender. That's what the protein <laughs> shakes in those days were like. <laughs> uh, but... <clears throat> so as I'm cranking down on eating more meat and vegetables and controlling my addiction, I'm noticing I'm getting strong as hell and I'm even getting fucking lean. I'm like, Jesus Christ, I'm, I'm all at this point. All I want to do is lift heavy shit, you know, but goddamn, my, my pants are getting looser in the waist and I'm looking better. Not that I look bad, but when you're getting stronger and your physique looks better, when you're trying to get really strong, most people are not worried about their physique getting better. Well, that's where I was. And I was like, okay. I, I, I mean, every week I walk in here and I know something heavier is going to get picked up than the week before. And, and to a lifter, that's the dream. Every week you go back, you can just feel it. When you, you, you warm up, you grab that bar and you're like, oh, fuck, it's going down. 
Yeah. And so <clears throat> that's that was the that was the eye opener. And and then from there, then it just starts that I started realizing that okay, well, I can't live off meat and vegetables. There's no fuel source in here. So I started playing with fats for a fuel source. And then because that was right in the beginning of like <clears throat> like uh these marathon runners were realizing that they took God back in those days it was called a power bar. I don't know if you remember a power bar. Yeah, yeah. They would take a power bar. And they would put a big thing of peanut butter over the top of it because the fat released longer for them when they were running. The yeah, carbohydrate yeah, was too yeah. was too vol too volatile. So I was like, "Well, wait a minute. Why don't I just put some?" I was like, "I little. Why don't I just put some peanut butter on my chicken?" Because that's what yeah, I was doing. So yeah. I was putting peanut peanut butter on chicken breasts. Next thing you know, that's where the whole thing started going. You know, yeah, I always remember when John Meadows used to. Uh, recommend a, a pre-workout food, for example, and he always used to recommend putting something like peanut butter or a fat to slow down the digestion of the carbohydrate. So how did you deal initially with the lack of carbohydrate in your diet? Well, you know, it's, 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 it's a good question because most people, they think, oh my God, I'm not having carbohydrates, I'm going to be so tired. Well, that's this. I, I just I wish there was a way that I could push a button and help people understand that carbohydrate is just one small element of having stable energy, and your blood sugar is is affected by so many more elements than just the carbohydrate. The carbohydrate actually makes your blood sugar more volatile, and yeah. energy comes from stable blood sugar. And yeah. so, <clears throat> anyway, so I had zero problems with it because i was eating often enough that my blood sugar was stable yeah, um, yeah. And, and so you know that's that's one of the things that again it's just one of these things that people think they know but unfortunately they they just don't have a clue you know yeah i think food's one of those things that people have like they, they, they've all got skin in the game in that respect so they've got their beliefs when it comes to food and particularly online people will battle each other and try and disprove things and tell you that you can't eat this way because this will happen or this won't happen when ultimately it's 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 about self-experimentation and seeing if you can roll with it i yep. mean the, the the way i would always try and like create the mindset to succeed at a diet a dietary approach like this is always equated to that new job experience where when you enter a new job for the first two weeks it's always hell because you don't know how things work you're still trying to find your feet and you're always thinking why did i leave my last fucking job i want to go back to my last job but then after two weeks you, you find your groove and yeah. things start to kick into place and that initial two-week period for example is what destroys most people yeah yeah well you know the I think when it comes down to it, um, like, again, going back to when I help you with my coaching, all I needed is if you can forget what you think you know, you're going to be just fine. Because let's go back to the, the example of the job. Let's say, you know, you're – and by the way, this is kind of a funny side note. I've never had a job. I've never <laughs> actually – I swear to God, that's probably one of my favorite claims of fame. I've never fucking collected a paycheck in my life. I've always found a way to do it by myself. You know, <laughs> anyway, so, but the whole process of if you go to a job, because I know that's a very, you know, most people are going to relate to that well. So let's just say you went to that job and you had somebody that said, okay, let's not just have you kind of try to figure this out as you go. I'm going to sit down and I'm going to explain to you exactly how this is going to work. So in about the next 90 minutes, you're going to understand when you do this, if you get this reaction, you do that. And if you do that, if you get this reaction, you do that. And, and it sets you like a connect the dots type scenario. That makes sense? Yeah. And that's the, I think that's the biggest problem when someone, people get put into a new diet situation with a, a coach because coaching is very popular now. And the standard is the coach gives them something and say, okay, here you go. And they're, they're just, they go to that scenario of the job like you're talking about. They're just, everything's so different and they're, banging into shit and oh my god how does this work and how does that work god damn it i should have stayed with my last coach or i should have versus <clears throat> you versus you know you can also choose to help someone have a really enjoyable experience in that first few days and that's i think that's kind of what's missed is that 
you know, with coaching in general, it's people make money doing it. And unfortunately, people chase money rather than chasing enjoyment. Yeah. And, yeah. and so like for me, yes, I get paid for my coaching, but I fucking love it, man. I, anything for me that connects itself to lifting weights and helping people get better, I enjoy it. And so when, when I bring someone new one on, it's very important to me that I help them understand, look, you're probably going to notice this. And if this happens, do that. And you might notice this. And if that happens, do this. And I give them the framework to make sure that they're not bumping into shit so much that it becomes an uncomfortable experience. But unfortunately, what you're describing is the norm in terms yeah. of people having really hard transitions into something new. And then I think, I think another problem with that is that, <clears throat> is that people are being kind of transitioned into something new, but it's really the same fucking shit with just a different fucking cover on it. That makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, it makes perfect sense, John. And so <laughs> when you ask somebody to do something that's really new and it really starts to work in a couple of days, it's a different, it's, you know, it's, it's like showing up to that new job and they just hold your hand until you're up and running. You yeah, know? yeah. You just need to trust the process in that respect and just kind of yeah. just let things happen naturally and just realize that the, the the first two weeks are always hell in any endeavor any training experience the first two weeks you're always finding your feet i mean is you would even say that with deep water no one's going to walk into their first deep water workout and they're going to blaze it they're going to be having to find their feet in that first couple of weeks of deep water <clears> before they start to unleash so john they're signing up for it. Shit, did I lose you there, brother? Sorry, somebody tried to call me. Yeah, you, you, I lost okay. you for a second. Okay, so John, another, another, another thing. Another thing I want to touch upon is when I initially discovered you, it was through Instagram. <laughs> and the one thing that captivated me was it was quite evident to me personally that you we're using your wrestling experience to get your message across. Forgive me one more time, brother, because the, somebody called again. And so I lost what you're saying. Could you please repeat the question? Fuck. I'm sorry. I, I declined them twice. So hopefully they won't call back again. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a low tech podcast. This is, this happens. Right. right. So when I first discovered you, it was through Instagram. And the one thing that captivated me and the one thing that I uh, clicked onto was that you were delivering your message, but you were using your wrestling experience yep. or you were yep. cutting a promo, so to speak, to get your message across. Okay. And this is, this is the part of the, the, the podcast that I want to get into for my own gratification. I think there was shades of macho man, Randy Savage, in your delivery. <laughs> You know, As, it, it's so you're, you're, are you asking me where the roots of my, my promos come from? Yes. <laughs> well, you know, that's, that's, that's one of the things that, I mean, my voice actually sounds quite a lot like, like the macho man, Randy Savage, for sure. But the funny thing is I've had this voice since my mom said I've had this voice since I finally went through puberty, you know? <laughs> Fucking 17 and a half years old, just about graduating high school. I had to shower for two years with no hair in my cock in high school, you know. <laughs> so when the when the hormones finally dropped, I got this voice. So that's one thing that I that I it, when in wrestling, one thing that you have to learn is that you know, you're a good character is is you is unique. You can't steal from an, from another one and expect that it's gonna be a good one. Yeah. That makes sense. That so makes you, know, you might have influence for sure, but if someone can look at you and go, I see Hulk Hogan, I see Randy Savage, I see, I took little bites of everybody. That makes sense. <clears throat> so, yeah, and then when it, when it comes down to, you know, cutting a promo, I think, the, and, and it, this is my wrestling career in a nutshell, is that, you know, I was a fucking terrible wrestler. I just, the way I looked, you know, the way I looked is what got me paid. Uh, yeah, yeah. And so <clears throat> all I have to do is be aggressive and yell and flex. And yeah, in yeah. those early days of those promos that you're talking about, 
you know, the message was, you know, it was fairly short, but the words were just part of the message. You know what I mean? It's like in a wrestling match, you know, you can get, you know, if I, if I was to just get up there and yell versus I'm to yell and flex, it's like an aura that you're, you know, so yeah, I mean, you're in the early days of influencing, you're trying to find what it is that people are going to resonate with about you. That makes sense. And, yeah, yeah. you know, and I'd gone from, I was first a pro strong and then a pro wrestler, then to pro bodybuilding. And so I was like, you know, my, I was gathering this kind of unique audience from all these different venues. But at the same time, I had also kind of acquired this ability to just turn the camera on myself and talk from wrestling and yeah. cut promos. So if you're fuck it, man, that was a lot of fun. I'm going to keep doing it. And people seem to resonate with it. So off it went. Cause in the beginning, those, if you, if you go far enough back on my page, you'll see the very early ones are me just giving advice, talking. And as I talked, I started to ramp up to see what the response was. And as I got more aggressive, the videos got more popular. Yeah. And it's refreshing because I'm, I think we're living in an age where a lot of things are neutered now. Whereas your message was very in your face. Mm-hmm. And obviously you delivered it with th- that like wrestling style, which kind of made the message more impactful, particularly for guys like me who were brought up in wrestling and still watch it. Who who have you been your biggest influences in wrestling, John? In wrestling? <clears throat> um, you know, the crazy part was, I was never even as a kid, I was never really a wrestling fan. I watched wrestling only because I liked the big dudes. You know, I just wanted to watch the, if there was no big guy in the ring, I didn't give a shit, you know, yeah. but I would say, I would say that I probably was influenced. And when I was a kid, you know, Hulk Hogan was like a household name at that point. So you, you, you had to, you almost had to be like under buried under the rock to not who he was, not who he was. I would say, um, he, this guy's not really a wrestler, but he did a little bit of wrestling, Mr. T. Of course, I know Mr. T. Yeah, yeah. So I would say because Mr. T and Hulk Hogan linked up, and I was like, that was the dream team for me. Yeah, it's funny. <laughs> it's funny you say that because you've you've basically described the cast of Rocky Three. Yeah, <laughs> no, Rocky. I'm telling you right now, Rocky Three was one of those movies. I remember this vividly. I'm in the movie theater, and you know, I'm I don't know how old I was. It was in my early teens, and I've got you know, a big fucking soda, probably two or three, four boxes of candy sitting in my fucking lap because that's what I did when I went to the movies. I fucking ate way too much shit. And then the movie starts and it's this over the top inspiring movie about, you know, big fucking strong guys are like what I want to do. And I can't eat a single fucking milk dud. (laughs) You know, because that thing in my belly was strong overriding my my you know now granted i not that i didn't eat that stuff but i couldn't eat it during the movie because that it was like i was you know i I was so inspired and so enthralled by what i was looking at and it was like it's like that's 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 what i want you know of course it wasn't like i wanted to be in the ring I, i just i wanted all i wanted was to be one of those big guys that's it do you, do you know it's it's like well, I'm going on a tangent here and I'm going to have to wrap this up soon, John. But you, you've you've made me think for a minute. When people think about movies with physiques, they always gravitate towards Army pumping iron, but no one really talks about Rocky Three on that level. And Rocky Three had probably the best training montages in the Rocky series, in my opinion. It's probably a toss-up between Rocky Two and Rocky Three. I think Rocky Two was more emotional. There was a big impact emotionally, but Rocky Three was just visceral power. And when you looked at Sylvester Stallone's physique, no one really puts Sylvester Stallone up there with regards to his influence on physique. Oh, but it he was, was huge. It was oh, huge. He was he was ripped in Rocky Three. I mean, that yeah. was like nobody had ever seen him look that way when he yeah. when that. Oh my God! Yeah, know that. I mean, it was like you know, Mr. T had a certain look. Hulk Hogan had a certain look. Rocky had a. They all had their own unique looks, and they were all completely amazing in their own way. 
Yeah, I yeah. think all all that Sylvester Sloan ate during Rocky Three was tuna. I'm sure I've read that somewhere. Yeah, he lived on tuna. That was it. No carbs, nothing, just tuna. Not even any fats. Yeah, but then that's the people thought fat made you fat back then. But anyway, anyway, John, listen, <laughs> listen, John, you've been a, an absolutely fantastic guest. I've I've had so much fun. Honestly, I like these episodes where I get a good laugh, as they say in Scotland. But just before we go, can you please tell the viewers and listeners where they can find you? Absolutely. So I would say the the uh, my Instagram is where I spend the most time. And I, I like I really do enjoy, um, you know, having conversations with people in my DMs. And I really it's I mean, I really try to inspire. And sometimes it's just giving a, you know, a, something, saying something uplifting or a piece of advice. But anyway, my Instagram, it's the john anderson so but keep in mind my name is spelled differently so it's j-o-n and then anderson is a-n-d-e-r-s-e-n so <clears throat> at the john anderson find me there um you know i've got other platforms too but it seems like that's where i spend most of my time interacting with people that want to come talk to me absolutely superb me and i will put that in the link in the description Anyway, John, it was an absolute pleasure. Hopefully I can get you on again at some point because it would be good to talk about the strong man in the bodybuilding days. Yeah, Thank brother. I, I, was, yeah, I don't think I've ever done a podcast where I've only come on one time, so I'm sure we'll have to do another one. <laughs> You're some man. You're some man. Anyway, listen, John, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, brother. <laughs>